Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Brad Weidra, and I've been lucky to be joined by Jessica Burbank. Uh, Jessica Burbank studied international politics at Brown University, was a regional field director for the Bernie Sanders campaign, and is now the data lead for the People's Action. Is there anything else that you'd like to add about yourself or give like a little bit of introduction as well? No, yeah, that pretty much covers it. That's a, a pretty good synopsis. Yeah, I'd say first and foremost, I'm an organizer, and beyond that, I do a lot of other things. Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah, what are what are some of the other things that you've been doing then to kind of uh, you know highlight your work a little bit and some of the organizing that you're you're currently working on? I know you you kind of have to be a little bit um, you know protective of some of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely an election going on right now, a pretty big one, I'd say. So yeah, I'm not going to talk too much about the work that's that's ongoing, but happy to, to share some reflections after after that's over with and November 3rd is, is done, or at least the results are counted, which might be after that. But yeah, I mean, I started off organizing around uh, corporate farming. I actually went to trade school because after the 2008 financial crisis, it really seemed like college was not an option for me or my sister. Um, and so I just decided to, to go to trade school instead and, and study agriculture and joined the FFA and realized that uh, small farms were being absolutely ravaged by large companies like Monsanto. And so I got really involved with public speaking and then realized that, you know, if we speak out uh, against issues to a larger audience, to other people who care about them, um, we can enact real change. And so from there ended up um, actually getting a leadership scholarship and like actually getting the chance to, to go to college and study all of these systems that I was determined to change. And so, you know, I really approach everything as an organizer, but um, I've been really lucky to study a lot of the things that I'm interested in um, in undergrad and graduate school as well but I definitely approach things from the perspective of, of an organizer always. That's amazing. I actually didn't know your background of getting involved in the farming. And um, there's actually an article that I kind of bring up in my channel pretty frequently. Have you heard of the Open Policy Institute? Um, Sounds familiar. They're, they're a think tank that does like a lot of anti-monopoly work. And they, they have a really good paper on the consolidation of the agribusinesses, whether it is, you know, Monsanto or it's talking about seeds or talking about like poultry and everything. Um, so this isn't exactly where I thought it was going to go, but what are what are some of your thoughts about how to try to like break up you know the monopolies? I mean, some of the some of the data points that they show is, I think uh, the top four companies own eighty seven percent of seed manufacturing. It's like eighty some percent of pork processing. You know, we sold a lot of our um, poultry you know to Brazil. We sold a lot of uh, pork processing to a holding company based in Hong Kong. So what are what are some of the actions that we can really do to like undertake and combat this? Yeah, I mean, the first one, it's an obvious one, but, but making food more local. And if you ask me this, you know, when I was a high schooler in the FFA, I would tell you, uh, coming from, you know, Stanford, Connecticut, which is pretty urban, um, seeing what we could do as far as, you know, greenhouse farming and farming in urban areas, there's a lot of really interesting stuff as far as hydroponics goes for actually growing local food in places that are quite urban. Um, but after spending the past year in Iowa and talking to farmers in southwestern rural Iowa on a day-to-day -day basis, the way it was described to me uh, by a lot of people that I respect is that farmers uh, are living season to season, and it's comparable to how working American people are living paycheck to paycheck. And they're quite literally doing whatever they can uh, to break even or even make a little bit money to keep their you know, their farm up and running. And a lot of people after the farm crisis had to sell their farms. Um, and they sold them to, to very large corporations, conglomerates uh, like Tyson. And so when you have uh, this reality that large corporations are going to, to basically suck the life out of small farms, first they're going to say, you know, we'll rent you these pigs for the season and you raise the hogs and then you sell them at the end of the season, but you never actually own the pigs. And then eventually you can't keep up the facilities um, to the requirements that these corporations place on you, like uh, to meet certain standards you can't afford to anymore and then eventually you sell your farm and then large amounts of land uh, in Iowa ends up being owned by these these big corporate farms. So I think like uh, definitely creating incentives uh, for small farmers to keep their farms and really investing in small farms with public funds because obviously our country having food is in public interest. And so yeah, I really think investing in small farms uh, and local farming is the way to go. You... I mean, I agree with you very much. You said that you were in Iowa last year. I'm guessing this was as a part of like the Bernie work? Yes, yeah. Um, so I was actually, I was in Des Moines from maybe 
maybe like January 5th until um, right after the caucus. Um, I was doing like some volunteer work um, based out of there. So we maybe, I guess you were in one of the smaller areas and we didn't really cross paths. Yeah, I worked actually in the southwestern corner of the state. So okay. everything from like Indianola to Council Bluffs. Actually. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's really amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, thankful that you went out and did all of that. Did you notice that a lot of the farmers there were concerned about the pollution from the um, pig industry? Because that seemed to be something that a lot of people were talking about was all like the nitrates that were kind of like getting into the water system. And additionally, it seemed like a lot more people were talking about um, flooding um, in Iowa as well. And then we had the derecho come. So did it seem to be that, um, you know, climate was kind of like becoming kind of like a bigger and bigger issue within the farming communities? Yeah, I think so. I don't think the connection is is made as often outside of places that have experienced flooding like Western Iowa and Nebraska. Um, yeah, a lot of people like Clorinda was underwater, um, a town in southwestern Iowa, and we actually did like a Green New Deal event there. Um, it was just me and like a few friends sort of outside of my regular work um, and like 30 people showed up. And that's that's more people than come together for like major events in town. So it goes to show that like when uh, your whole town's underwater, you start mm -hmm. paying attention and connecting the dots. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a really big learning experience for me to be out there and just um, like you said, kind of like learn how to organize more. Um, so it was it was an important part for me and like my learning process. Um, so it's it's interesting. It sounds like you started in agriculture, and then from what I've kind of like learned about you from looking through some of your work, it seems that you kind of shifted to studying like interventionism and imperialism in university. So how did you how did you make that shift uh, from you know one type of activism and organizing into like kind of another style of it? Yeah, so started off really uh, issue based organizing around uh, corporate farming, of course, and then um, I actually got a, a leadership scholarship when I was a sophomore, which is not really, you know, a time when you're thinking a lot about where you're going to go to college, especially if you're in a trade school. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was to Wells College. Um, so I started looking uh, because I'd written off going to college, really, it was either going to be like community college and working through it really uh, tough um tough situation after the financial crisis but um yeah this this scholarship sort of changed my view and uh created an impact and so wells became like sort of like the dream that like maybe i'll be able to go and so with pell grants and scholarships and stuff i was able to go and it's super small it's like uh about 500 students total wow, okay. and uh there's two basically faculty professors who teach political science um, one of them was Tukumbi Lumumba Kasongo, and he's actually the nephew of Patrice Lumumba, who um, was the leader, of course, in the Congo when they were fighting for liberation. And you can imagine that Tukumbi brought a certain perspective uh, to the classroom that growing up in a working American family with parents who had never really left the area or the country, my dad did some camping, but they didn't really uh, give me an international perspective in the way that Takumbi did. And he really quickly became a mentor to me and I became his teaching assistant and really just, just being exposed, uh, to new ideas. I was, I was hooked, um, and became very interested in, in Africana studies, which was his specialty. And that's eventually what led me to, to actually go and, and study in South Africa was, was learning under his mentorship. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I did want to ask, what what are a couple of things that you, um, I mean, you kind of mentioned them, but that you learned that you don't think you would have been able to gain that perspective, you know, here domestically? Um, I, I never had the opportunity to study abroad, and it's one thing that I, um, there's not many things that I'd like to go back and change, but that would be one that I, I wish that I could have done. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, just experiencing other cultures beyond uh, what happens in America. I mean, <laughs> I come from an area of like a lot of uh, you know, immigrants settle in, you know, the areas outside of New York City. And so, you know, you're exposed to different cultures, but uh, South Africa gives you an, an external perspective on the country you grew up in. And quite honestly, the way that we teach history and the way t we teach, you know, our citizens about the world in public schools is very different um, from what you would get if, if you grew up in South Africa. And so speaking to people, um, who grew up with a, a bit of a more worldly and accurate education than what we get, you know, we get mm -hmm. things from a very US centric view. Um, that's huge. Um, and so just just talking with other students, and there was a, a huge uprising of protests while I was I was at the school and seeing how they organize and 
you know, make demands of the university that they go to and make demands of their municipal government was very different from, from how people organize in the US. Um, so really getting that experience was what impacted me. Um, especially, you know, seeing how people live outside of Cape Town, you know, the legacy of apartheid is extremely um, in your face uh, when you're in South Africa, of course. And so talking to folks, especially someone I worked with very closely uh, named Sabu in the Langa Township outside of Cape Town, where you had uh, Black South Africans uh, really forced outside of the city centers. Just being there, um, there was a lot of touring going on. So people do these things called like township tours. And I, I did interviews of a lot of people, you know, within the Langa Township, what do you think about these tours? Um, you know, sort of me having the, the presupposed idea that maybe they don't like them, maybe they feel a little bit like, I don't know, like zoo animals, you're coming in and, and just looking at me and paying to walk through my streets to see what my way of life is. And I mm -hmm. thought, you know, of course, that's what I'm going to hear. And I ended up hearing like, you know, we're really happy to share our way of life mm -hmm. and to share our history, because if we weren't doing this for Americans, you would, you would never learn. Um, <laughs> and so that was kind of refreshing um, and really interesting to learn. So yeah, just seeing that people are quite happy. Um, and I think happiness is very material in the United States. So seeing where other cultures derive happiness, I think is something you definitely get when you travel abroad. Yeah, um, well, this actually, okay, this brings up a question that I wasn't thinking of asking. Um, how do we begin to, this is a very tough one, uh, like break down the materialistic and the consumption-based happiness culture that we have here? Uh, you know, we're always, you always see advertisements, you always see billboards, you, you have targeted ads, you know, on your phone all the time and so forth. So a thing that we talk a lot about in the channel is like trying to, you know, I'm kind of a little bit against the fashion industry or maybe even a little bit more against it just due to, you know, the intensity of the water that gets used, you know, the carbon emissions that comes from it. So how do we begin to break this dynamic that seems to be so ingrained in American culture at the moment? Yeah, I think the first thing would have to be, um, you know, showing people that, that you can find meaning in, in other places. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, you know, in a culture so dominated by capitalism, it's going to be really hard uh, to break through, you know, the ads of what people are seeing every day and the information that's being forced on people's throats of like, oh, you need to buy this and then, mm -hmm. you know, everything will be better and then it's the next thing. I think, you know, having more sustainable sources of happiness, like, like making music, like having a sense of community, um, having an alternate source of happiness would, would be the main thing right? We could rail against materialism. It's so bad. You don't need it. But unless we're providing an alternative source of, of meaning and happiness, I think it's going to be really hard to move away from a culture that's very centered around materialism. That's really important. And I think one thing that you mentioned to me in our um, messages back and forth was, you know, just that you have to, you do have to provide the alternatives. You have to provide something to look forward to. You have to provide something to build on, you know, some type of community feel to have. Uh, final, final thing that I want to ask like, about South Africa is, um, Last year, I, I think that there was a terrible drought uh, in Cape Town and there were there were water restrictions and um, just like a lot of kind of water shortages and everything. Is that something that you can speak to at all and kind of like, um, you know, elucidate the audience as to like what was happening? It, it seemed to be almost at like um, drastic. Well, I mean, it was drastic, um, but I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah, I actually wasn't there um, at all while this was happening, mm -hmm. so I can't really say what it was like to be there, but hearing from friends experiencing it, it was really interesting um, just to hear where people were looking for solutions to the water crisis. Um, there were a lot of students at the university involved with research and not a lot of them were, were credited for sort of the innovation oh, wow. that occurred in a lot of the research labs in the universities and they were sort of uh, taken by corporations. Uh, you can imagine mm -hmm. I have a particular leaning with this and I'm looking for corporations being the bad guy, but that's really what I was hearing from people on the ground there is that when they were when they were finding solutions, uh, there were a mm -hmm. lot of good people coming up with them and other people sort of executing and taking credit for them. Yeah. Um, the one other thing that it sounds like you did some like kind of international work, even though it was on domestic soil, was you went to the Nicaragua conference hosted by the Watson Institute. So what were some of the lessons that you were able to take away and then you molded into kind of your organizing style and now your strategic um, your style that you're using now? Yeah, this was huge. I was really lucky when I was a graduate student to be a, a teaching assistant to Stephen Kinzer, <laughs> who 
I strongly recommend reading everything he writes. Not only is he a brilliant writer, but he brings such an amazing perspective to his work. Um, having been in Nicaragua during the 80s, uh, reporting for the New York Times, which was really sort of trumpeting the rhetoric of the Reagan administration to then sort of realizing uh, everything he had reported was precisely that and taking a different stance and becoming extremely critical of US interventionism and then becoming quite an expert on the subject. And so the class that I was able to teach with him at Brown was on US interventionism. And at Brown, you can imagine there's a, a decent amount of students who come from very elite backgrounds, some of which mm -hmm. whose families were directly involved with what we were studying. So that was extremely interesting. But yeah, one day he just sort of said, hey, this weekend, um, we're having a conference on, on Nicaragua and the revolution in 79, it's been 40 years and a bunch of the main actors from Nicaragua are flying in wow. and we're all going to talk about what happened in Nicaragua in 1979. And so you have actors that were adversaries in a revolution that was also a Cold War proxy war, mm -hmm. talking about what happened, what went wrong, what we can learn from it. It was amazing. I mean, I don't think anything like this has ever happened in history where you have opposing revolutionary forces getting in a room together and saying, uh, for the sake of humanity, what can we learn about what what happened um, 40 yep. years later? Yeah, it so. sounds like it was really an amazing conference. And I'm yeah. I'm very happy for you that you got to experience a lot of these like different learning styles. Um, it's really wonderful. Um, where was I thinking of asking next? Um, so you've kind of it sounds like you've now shifted into doing like a lot of data driven work, whereas before it from my feeling of it, you were doing more like person to person work. So what has the shift kind of been for you to not be like out in front as much and not be on the ground as much and maybe doing like a little bit more behind the scenes uh, work? Yeah, I would say I've sort of gone back and forth um, quite a bit, but it was just sort of like I went where the work took me. Okay. Um, when I was in graduate school at Brown, we had to you know, it was a master's in public affairs and you have to take courses on statistics and economics. And I really just sort of took to it. Um, I was never really a quant or, or a math <laughs> person, but I really like data work. It was more like logic work than anything. And most of the information in the world lives in the form of, of data. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a curious person, I was naturally drawn to, to doing, you know, work that was very focused on where the information lies. Um, and yeah, I accidentally ended up uh, really focusing on, on data work and data driven policy, specifically a lot of public policy research work, which it felt like, uh, and you're, you're sort of pointing out this contrast existed in contrast to what I was interested in and what I still am interested in, which mm -hmm. is like organizing people for, you know, liberation and better forms of government. And it was really confusing working in a research lab that's very carefully articulating like means tested policies. But then I'm attending this Nicaragua conference where I'm, I'm learning from people that were trying to implement democratic socialism for the first time. Um, and so that's honestly uh, was one of the major things that motivated me to, to leave the work in research labs and go work for the Sanders campaign because it felt so disconnected from my experiences growing up in a working American family. I mean, uh, you working on policies that are just so targeted and, and not relevant to the needs of the people that they're supposed mm. to be serving. I felt that we needed uh, more comprehensive universal programs like Medicare for all, um, like a Green New Deal, um, like free college, free public college and free higher education. And I think that uh, we're never going to overcome you know, these major barriers to living in a, a more equal society if we're carefully targeting people to make them slightly more comfortable so that they're not revolting. Mm -hmm. That's really what it felt like. And so I had to get out of it. And now I'm sort of in a role where I'm converging my data experience with my my sort of move, movement oriented perspective, which is really rewarding. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, the I'm going to have to read this one because I typed it up and I did a decent job of it. But uh, it sounds like Senator Sanders wants to engage in a heavy pressure campaign against Biden. Uh, and AOC has mentioned that she's looking forward to lobbying Biden about fracking. So a lot of people in kind of like the online space that I inhibit, we're kind of wondering, is there a national organized movement of like sustained, you know, protests to be done during the first 100 days of Biden's office? Uh, you know, if there is, like, how can we get involved? If there isn't, kind of what can we do? And what I've been thinking of doing is 
I, I don't know if there's anybody going over to Washington, D.C., but I planned on trying to go, you know, right at the beginning when Joe takes office to be like, hey, like, you're not good enough. Um, so what are what are some of your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I think it's an excellent idea that we're already planning to put pressure on a Biden administration if he's elected, because I think if we don't and if the movement does not organize for all of our demands, we're going to end up with a uh, a more intense, more articulate, more powerful version of Trump in a few years. I really think uh, the descent into fascism in the United States, if we're not already already there, um, which we might have been for quite a while, um, I think it's it's inevitable that we could end up living in sort of like a, a police state, um, which we almost already do. But I think that it's it's really good that we're thinking about this and, and the left is definitely organizing for um, immediate direct actions if there there is a contested election. I've heard from so many different groups that are already planning so many, um, you know, really well thought out strategic uh, plans. I think, yeah, there will be a, sort of a, a whole host of things that we can do, uh, you know, if election results start coming in and they look funky, I think a lot of people are going to flock to their county election boards. I think that um, if, if it goes to the Supreme Court, there are going to be a lot of people protesting on the, the front steps. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in, in Florida, after you know Bush Gore, um, we saw people protesting and sort of the Democratic Party at that point in time didn't, didn't really send people to go take direct action. They were kind of like, we're going to let the courts figure it out. And I think that lack of public pressure is precisely why we saw the outcome that we did. And so, yeah, we're absolutely ready uh, to be out in the streets if there's a contested election. I think that's universal across the movement. And county election boards and swing states, I think, will be the place to go. Do you, um, do you recall any of the names of the groups that um, you, you have heard are already trying to put together, like coalitions, and put together some of the direct actions at all? It's, it's quite literally all of okay. them. Yeah, I think, you know, we can expect uh, calls to action from, from quite literally every every organizing group. Yeah, the, one, yeah, yeah. wonderful. Um, and when I was listening to your TED Talk, you, you really focus on, you know, democratizing the workplace, uh, you know, democratizing our institutions in like a broad spectrum. And additionally, you mentioned, you know, discussing nationalizing the energy grid. Um, and it's kind of, this is like a little bit of a stranger question, but how can we, how can we develop language that isn't um, immediately getting us called communists or, you know, like, because I've, I've had a tough time where I'm from the, uh, the coal region of Pennsylvania. So, I mean, a lot of blue collar work, a lot of like conservative ideology. And I have to be so careful when I speak with a lot of the people there because they immediately think that I'm just like this crazy individual. So what are, what are some of the ways that you think we can continue to push forward these issues and get to the solutions that we really need? Otherwise, like you said, it's going to go to barbarism. Yeah, I think first and foremost, we definitely need to do a better job of bringing in the working class and working people into this movement for a more democratized economy because they're the people first and foremost whose lives are directly affected by the economic system we have in the worst ways. And I think that if the language we use to describe what we are fighting for is overwhelmingly academic we're never going to bring in the working class and we're never going to have a coalition that's the majority of, of the country. And so I think we need to do a better job um, speaking to working class people in their own terms. I mean, I grew up, I grew up in a, a, a working uh, family. My parents were able to like, you know, get us through a lot of tough times, but my dad's, my dad's a carpenter, my mom and, and dad don't have college degrees. And so I remember when I was first, you know, exposed to the ideas of socialism and what it could bring us, when I talked to my mom about it, who was rather conservative at the time, I was just sort of describing, you know, you've worked really hard your whole life. Do you feel like you, you have, uh, you know, earned the fruits of your labor in this country? You know, we're taught that you work hard and you do the right things you pay your taxes and you're rewarded. You get like the American dream or what have you. Mm -hmm. And yet still uh, people who are, are her age are struggling to have a savings or a retirement account. Uh, they're on the brink of being completely bankrupt. You know, one one bad medical event could, could make you quite literally declare bankruptcy. It's the number yeah. one cause of bankruptcy in this country. And so I think when you when you frame it that way, like you've worked to build this society that we all live in, um, you've, you know, quite literally built things with your own hands like my father has. 
don't you think you deserve a slice of, mm -hmm. you know, what we have all come together and made? And I think when you frame it that way, like you're not getting what you've been promised by the government. And it's because if you look um, sort of at the wealth gap, it's because el elites are extracting, you know, the fruits of our labor. And there is definitely a sense of this among the working class, but they're using different words to describe it. Um, there is discontent with, you know, their bosses and the elite, but we, we frame it in a really different way than I think most people talk about it on an everyday basis and bridging that gap is gonna be crucial to, to building power and building like a unified coalition of people for, you know, a better system. Yeah, I, yeah thank you for sharing that. I really do appreciate it. Um, and it kind of transitions into the next thing. Um, it seems from my reading that about 19% of uh, corporations in the United States are considered zombie companies at the moment. I mean, I, I think it's a lot more. Um, you see the airlines, you know, begging for bailouts when they just did 97% of free cash flow for stock buybacks. You know, Boeing is begging for, um, you know, more bailouts. And um, there was some data from 2017 that said around 55 million United States workers are working in the gig economy, which is, I mean, very precarious work, no benefits, no health care. Um, so how how can we protect the working class going into next year when we're going to have record high unemployment jobs are going to be offering lower and lower wages if they're going to be offering a wage at all because they're trying to automate a lot of work away so i've actually i'm, I'm very concerned just for next year that um I, I don't exactly know where people are going to be able to find jobs here where i live in philadelphia um the, the zip code just north of me has a terrible unemployment rate and that was prior to COVID 19. it was around like 35 percent um, so uh, this is a tough question and an open-ended one, but what are some of your thoughts about, you know, the plight of the working class going into 2021? Yeah, absolutely. I think we need another much bigger stimulus. Um, I think the first stimulus, uh, helped pay some of the bills in the, in the month that came out for most people. Um, you know, so many people were laid off, lost their jobs, and some people who were not are now like extremely exposed to COVID because they need to work to survive and maybe they have a pre-existing condition, maybe they don't have health care, but they, they need to put food on the table. And so they're putting themselves at risk in the middle of a pandemic to go out and work. And so I think we need a stimulus and we need another shutdown to get the virus under control because, um, you know, eventually we will, we will need to reopen the economy. And I don't think the virus is something we can live with, as Trump keeps saying. Um, and we've seen extreme success in countries like like Taiwan and like Vietnam um, where, and New Zealand, where they've, they've shut down and taken the proper precautions to get this under control and quarantined people who have tested positive um, and, and really made them comply with their quarantine to get it under control so that eventually they, they could reopen safely. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, we do need a major stimulus, um, public money uh, going to people so that they can literally just, just pay their bills and put food on the table. Um, and yeah, after that, we, we also need to, to shut down again because the way this spread is, is happening, it looks like it's not going to get under control unless everyone goes home. Um, yeah, this, yeah. Um, this really brings up like a tougher one that I've been trying to think about. And um, let's see if I can frame it the way that I intend to. Um, do you think that it would be, okay, how do, we, how do we allow corporations to go bankrupt and restructure without the workers just being kicked out on the streets and then being the ones that take the brunt of it? Because I'm not really for bailing out the airlines. I'm not really for bailing out Boeing and so forth. I, I want it to be restructured and I want it to be redeveloped. Do you think that this is the moment to attempt like, um, you know, a public ownership? I, I try to avoid the word nationalization again, just because, you know, people are going to be, uh, you know, communist all of a sudden. Um, but what do you think we can do to, I want to bail out the workers, but I don't want to just continue shoveling money to companies and hoping that they're going to trickle it down. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a complicated one. Um, I mean, the airline industry already re requires such an intense level of coordination across different major companies just just to have, you know, uh, air traffic function in a way um, that makes sense. And so I think, yeah, of course, I'm leaning towards like, yes, we, we shouldn't, you know, nationalize the airline industry, you know, why not? Mm -hmm. uh, if it creates like, um, a like like travel is essential to the economy and making travel more accessible is a good thing and i think uh to some degree like things like the new york metro that are are partially you know publicly funded and run i think that's a good thing and i think um 
people sort of demonize the word like nationalization. Oh my gosh, this means that like a few elites are going to run the airline industry and the people have no say about how it's run. But if we think about travel as a public good, everyone wants to get from A to B, everyone wants to, to be able to travel across the country. Uh, if we think about it that way, it's sort of like, okay, yeah, maybe we should nationalize the airline industry so we can have also better regulation to maybe make sure that that airlines don't go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think we're going to run into a very dangerous um, sort of circumstance really soon if if travel becomes extremely exclusive, which it already is. It's very expensive to travel on an airplane and only some people can can travel around the globe or the country for work or what have you. And only some people have access to, to other technologies, right? Like computing power, like coding, it's extremely exclusive. And to have things like, like travel and tech become very exclusive, it only allows power to continue um, sort of agglomerating at the top. And that's one of the biggest things that we've got to fight and, and bringing things under public ownership is a way to do it. But that's just like one step. We also mm -hmm. need people to be real stakeholders in their government. And right now, our democracy that's supposedly a representative democracy doesn't quite look like that. It feels like our political systems are sort of outdated compared to popular demands. Um, and, and really, things are becoming more exclusive than ever, including the airline industry, including tech. We've really got to get creative yeah. uh, to tackle it. This, I keep thinking of more and more questions now. Something that I kind of wanted to show, like in contrast of what's happening in Wales. So Wales is having problems with their uh, public transportation at the moment, or their transportation at the moment, and they've nationalized um, some of their industries. Whereas here, the United States, Amtrak, um, they're cutting services to rural communities, they're furloughing workers, they're firing workers. Um, I live in Philadelphia, and the SEPTA right now is having to cut service lines. The New York City Metro Transit Authority is about $12 billion uh, in the hole. So I'm very concerned that um, rather than going into a more public ownership, we're going to just be seeing privatization happening kind of all across the country in a lot of these different transportation sectors. And that's going to leave all of the rural communities behind. And it's just it's something that I'm, I'm really concerned for. Um, Bernie was kind of trying to fight for his democratization of the workforce through uh, transferring 2% of outstanding shares to the workers per year over a 10 year period and trying to get um, 40 to 45% of uh, the workers to be on the board of directors. So what I kind of wanted to ask you is um, what exactly do you think really is like democratization of the workforce if you kind of just want to like, you know, break it down in simple terms? And what are, what are some of the methods that you think we should be trying to consider in order to achieve um, these ends? Yeah, I think Bernie's workplace democracy plan was a really good one um, and exposed a lot of ideas that, um, you know, people wouldn't be thinking about otherwise. But for me, real workplace de democracy means that workers own the means of production. Um, I think that you cannot make decisions uh, about what goes on in society as a CEO of a corporation. Um, you know, if we think about Amazon owning the vast majority of cloud space, mm -hmm. um, you have to literally like give Amazon money almost any time you, you want to use big data and use it on the internet in a cloud and share it with other people. I mean, using S3 buckets and Redshift is something I do all day long. And yet everyone I work with hates Jeff Bezos, you know, it's the worst. Um, and so I think, yeah, yeah, we've definitely got to bring the means of production into, into the control of the workers and how to do that is probably like the question of a lifetime, right? How do we create a sustainable system where workers have power? I mean, we see in revolutions like in Nicaragua in 1979, where immediately people take power, they take control of industry, and then almost out of reasonable fear, um, the CIA was intervening, various right-wing international groups started intervening. People, people want to be extracting resources. They don't want resources to be in the hands of the people. They want, it, they want them to be able to be extracted for profit. And I think that's the, the biggest threat is that we don't have sort of this, this free um, ability to just construct things from the ground up. We have outside forces coming in and trying to break things down. And that makes it really hard to make these plans because you always have to be thinking about that factor if there are going to be some extreme right wing people who want to intervene with with this plan um, and who will maybe even infiltrate and come to power and then shift the means of production back into the hands of the few or or make them you know more restricted. And I think that's been one of the biggest problems with communist uprisings is is then suddenly 
you have, you know, mass control of, of power and resources with no real way to, to sort of um, solicit uh, opinions from the people of, of what do you want us to be doing as a society with all of the resources we have at our disposal. Um, and I think, you know, maybe we can use data and tech tools to, to bridge that gap. Um, maybe, uh, you know, there's, there's some really intense form of referendum voting among, among all of the people. And there's, you know, some sort of device that allows you to vote on various things of, of what should we prioritize? Should we prioritize this kind of green energy? Are we interested in pursuing this kind of research as a society and having, you know, real direct democracy and decisions being made, not only about politics and government, but about the economy as well, which is a system everyone has a stake in. And we teach civic sets in school, but we don't teach economics. And I think really educating the people in economics will allow them uh, to, you know, come up with ideas of, of how can we create a democratic economic system and have a say over what's going on in our economy. Yeah, you mentioned, you actually brought up like the voting part a little bit. And um, I'm not going to ask like, the traditional voting question that a lot of people seem to be discussing. Um, I, I think that you and I would both agree, Citizens United, we need to get big money out of politics. That's pretty much just like, you know, done. Um, but aside from that, um, have you thought much about um, either like ranked choice voting or, um, you know, Andrew Yang was talking a little bit about his democracy dollars as a way to publicly fund elections. I recently tried to read through a paper from the Talk Buterin about quadratic voting, where you, um, if you wanted to vote like a second time for something, it would become a little bit more uh, difficult or cost intensive or so forth. So are, are you thinking that a, a reimagining of the voting system needs to take place in the United States in, in order to achieve some of these broad goals? Yes. Yeah, I, I absolutely think we need ranked choice voting. I think that's huge. I think uh, the two party system is, is a big barrier to, to progress. Um, I don't see establishment Democrats as being too different from your typical Republican. To me, I sort of see like all of the people versus the ruling class. And there are some people who have run on Democratic tickets that have the interests of the people in, in mind and are fighting for us. And they run as, as Democrats because the Democratic Party is supposedly the party of the working people, which might have been lost, um, and they're trying to bring it back. And so I support people like that, but I mean, maybe they don't need to be affiliated with a particular party. Maybe we should just be voting on, on a ranked choice system of a series, of, like for a series of candidates and, and sort of forego this party machine that's dominated our politics. Is that realistic? You know, I'm not quite sure, but I think... Uh, a ranked choice voting system, even where we still have a Republican and Democratic Party is is better than what we have now, where people are sort of blindly voting along party lines, um, because that's the party they identify with and, and don't put much more thought into it. Um, I think ranked choice voting would encourage a major sea change in how people look at politics and our democracy. Yeah, this has been wonderful so far. I looked over at the chat a couple of times and a few people said you're a wonderful resource of information. So we're very appreciative to have some of your time. Um, I only have like one or two uh, questions left. And y you you were talking about the Green New Deal. You were talking about, you know, interventionism, imperialism, you know, the United States uh, and the wars and the overthrows that they've done. So um, one person wanted me to ask, uh, what are your thoughts on tackling climate change by moving the laborers, workers and the soldiers out of the military industrial complex uh, towards green energy? Um, you've probably seen some of the studies how the United States military is the world's largest carbon emitter. Um, so how do we how do we begin to you know defang this military? How do we begin to stop you know all the foreign wars um, and so forth? Pretty open ended, um, but I'll leave that for you. Yeah, I love this idea so much. There is so uh, much capacity for research and innovation of really bright people that's going towards creating more advanced weapons to to fight against enemies of the United States that we have created ourselves. Um, so, I mean, we could go into long conversations about how the CIA trained, you know, the Mujahideen and, you know, created the Taliban and what have you. But um, at the end of the day, we're investing way, way too much money on developing weapons and training people to, to mm -hmm. be destructive and to kill others in the name of, of having strong defense when quite literally it is the military industrial complex, like they said. And yeah, I think we need the best and brightest minds not taking a job with Lockheed Martin because they're paying them the most money. Mm -hmm. We need those people investing in green energy, investing in new agricultural systems, investing in, in restructuring our education system and coming up with better ideas to raise citizens who can, who can tackle global problems like climate change. And so I think yeah, we absolutely need to de divest in the military industrial complex and, and really taking a huge shift um, and, and putting a lot of the effort and, and resources into green energy makes sense. 
um, just sort of rechanging the purpose of the infrastructure that's already there. Yeah. Um, and then one of the, the final ones that I had, and I don't want to, um, you know, take up too much more of your time is, um, what did you think about the MAS uh, victory in overturning the coup from the United States and the fascist Janine Añez, uh, you know, moving out of power? Do you think that this is going to kind of like begin like a little bit of a tide of people kind of moving towards more democratic socialism or, um, you know, how do you, how do you kind of think this is going to be able to go? Yeah. Yeah. My analysis is quite different, but somewhat frames into the context of your question. Okay. I think that um, exactly what Evo Morales did was what I described about a left-wing movement coming to power and being threatened by possible intervention of external right-wing forces um, and the effort to sort of change the constitution to extend or eliminate term limits um, was quite literally because uh, Eva was rightly afraid that right-wing powers would come in and, and try and instate a coup in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, free and fair elections are a huge open invitation to foreign intervention. I mean, wherever there's been a free and fair election, it's been ripe for the CIA to just come in and plant strategic propaganda to completely skew the results and how people are thinking about politics in their own country. And so I think that, you know, there was this fear that the right would come in and try and take power in Bolivia. And then we saw, you know, Luis Arce win by a 26% margin. Um, and I think that was huge. And it goes to show that like the term limits were not set in place because Evo needed to protect power for the socialists in Bolivia. I think they were set in place to sort of uh, address this very real fear of, of right wing power coming into Bolivia. And I think that 26% margin is more indicative of what organizers have done in Bolivia. I remember hearing you know, Orlando Gutierrez, who's a union leader there, talk about not, this is great, we won, everything's good now, but instead started talking about workers need to be organizing uh, to get our demands met. Um, you know, unions need to be coming together to ensure that the needs of the people are met by the government. So it wasn't just like, we have the end all be all, this person's coming to power, but it was more so like, um, the people were educated on what they needed to be doing to ensure their needs were met. It wasn't like this one leader was going to fix everything. It was more so, you know, it's on us. And you can really tell that the, the people in Bolivia on the ground and the workers are very united in ways that we have not seen, you know, anywhere else in the world. They were really developing strong relationships with the indigenous community. And to have people who are, you know, union workers and in industry um, going and building alliances with the indigenous community shows like a very strong multiracial working class coalition in Bolivia. So power does not just exist because they elected a socialist leader, mm, but it's mm -hmm. because these ideas are so strong in Bolivia. And that's something that, although the ideas of the Sandinistas in Nicaragua were so powerful, right? It was the first time they were really fighting for, for democratic socialism. At the conference, there was someone who was a Mosquito Indian, uh, Armstrong Wiggins. And, you know, he spoke out about the Sandinistas committing atrocities and, and burning the trees where indigenous folks in Nicaragua were living uh, because they wouldn't side with the Sandinistas. And the indigenous community basically said, you know, you can't manipulate us because we live off of the land. You can't cut off our, our food. Um, you can't manipulate us to join your coalition. Uh, we think that, you know, Marxist, Leninist ideas uh, come from the West. And, and we're good on our own. And so the idea that you have united front among people, you know, who are socialists, who have a particular ideology with people who are indigenous, who have very different views of the world and how society should be constructed is huge. And so I think, you know, if we learn from Bolivia and work to, to educate other people um, and sort of get them to, to get a sense of, of our theory of change and our vision for a better world, that will build stronger coalitions. And I think that's what we can take from Bolivia. We can't just say, you know, because the Socialist Party won uh, after a coup, um, that everything's good now and this will probably happen in other places. I think what we need to take away is that when we organize, we win. Um, and when we educate people and build coalitions, we win. I mean, I don't think that there's any better way uh, to wrap it up than kind of um, how you just said it there. Um, how yeah. can, yeah, how can people, you know, follow your work or, you know, support your work? Or do you recommend like um, any, I guess, are there any organizations that are very community-based but are kind of like, broader across the country. Um, so yeah, just like towards the end of it, what are a couple of, you know, actions that you'd like to highlight and bring awareness to? Yeah, I would say when I joined the Sanders campaign, I'd organized a little bit before, but every organizer has a methodology um, that they follow. 
And the trainings that, you know, I loved the most when I was coming on board with the Sanders campaign actually had the roots in people's action where I work now. Um, and I will say that people's action, uh, I said, I wouldn't talk about where I work now too much, but it's become my political home since leaving the Sanders campaign. And it's because they have a really solid theory of change. They are very focused, um, on building a, a movement that's joyous and not just sort of angry at current circumstances, but a lot of people who come together and support each other fighting for ambitious things like COVID relief, like a green new deal, like housing guarantees and things that are really popular. And so we actually have like the most effective canvassing method to change people's minds, uh, to get them to, you know, not vote for Trump this time around that we've deployed in battleground states. So if organizing against Trump is your thing, we've got that program, but all of our work at the national level is really based in member orgs, in communities, in states. And so, yeah, it's just a, an extremely great model for a lasting movement and their trainings are rooted in like the labor movement in the 90s mm -hmm. uh, or in the 70s. And so they're proven to work and they're really strong. Um, and if you want to learn like how to put sort of, you know, your investment in theories and ideas into action, I recommend like attending their organizer trainings and organizing events. Yeah. Um, just once again, thank you so much. It's been informative. Um, I know that a lot of people enjoyed it and um, we're really thankful that you, you know, took some of your time out of a very busy schedule, especially when it's getting right up to election season, you know, on a Sunday afternoon to come and chat about something like this. So um, I think that people can probably follow you on Twitter. It's uh, twitter.com slash Jessica L. Burbank. Okay. I think that's my handle. I don't know what my URL is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say before uh, we end? No, yeah, I can't see anyone on the other side, but if you have like more questions or anything, uh, definitely reach out. Uh, it's been fun taking some time away from my computer screen and coding all day to talk about, you know, more interesting, you know, theoretical bigger picture. Yeah, we thing. had um, we had about 84 people watching uh, live and they were all kind of like talking back and forth. I wasn't really reading what they were saying. I was kind of just like trying to focus in, um, but then I'll be putting the video up on YouTube. Uh, so hopefully, you know, some more people will sh uh, have the message. So just really thank you once again for all your time. Yeah, 